Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Brian, it's good to have you back. It's been a while. It has been. We missed you. We did. Thank you. I missed you all as well. We are talking today about an oft-used poetic image, uh, Swords into Plowshares. Um, this is from both Isaiah and Micah, and we're going to follow the three rules of biblical interpretation, which are context, context, and context. So, <laughs> uh, well, specifically biblical context, right? <laughs> because this pops up everywhere. It's in the deleted scenes of Fiddler on the Roof. It's in Les Miserables. It's in the United Nations Garden, which I didn't know was a thing. Um, and and You've Michael never seen Jackson. seen statue? Yeah. Oh, Michael Jackson. I forgot that. <laughs> so this, this is everywhere, but it comes from the Bible. Mm-hmm. And what what's the context? The, the context, context, context thing is so important because... Notice all the varied people you just described as using it, and their very varied worldviews. And different ends. <laughs> different <laughs> yes. points they are making. <laughs> yeah. The one in the United Nations Garden is on a statue. So it's a statue of a man, oddly enough, beating a sword into a plowshare. The, so far, so good. Yeah. And it has the verse. <laughs> Interesting thing is the statue was crafted by a Russian-born sculptor and presented to the United Nations by the Soviet Union, while it was still the Soviet Union. Meaning it hated the Bible and everything it stands for. Yeah, but it found something in the Bible it could twist to its own ends. Because it sounds good. Even even from a secular standpoint, it still doesn't... I should say, the secular misunderstanding of the verse, it still is very hypocritical of them to do so. (laughs) (laughs) You mean they didn't take all of their nuclear research and turn it into <laughs> something? A garden? No, no, they wanted us to do that. Oh. <laughs> something for everybody else to do. Yeah. So, I, I think if you asked most humans on the planet if it were a good thing, if humanity allocated all of the energies and time and monies that it spends on war, together at the same time and spent them instead on agriculture, on feeding the world, I, I think we would all say, as long as we're all doing it and no one's holding back their nuclear um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> power, the nuclear missiles in reserve, that this sounds okay. It, 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 it sounds promising. It sounds like that would be good. No, I mean, it implies no more wars and we all want no more wars, right? And more food. And more food. So it seems win-win. And so it's not odd, I think, in the long run, that so many people who either are not Christians or lay claim to some kind of odd Christianity would lay would lay hold on this and say, "This is the goal. This is where history should go." Well, we're glad they agree with God, (laughs) but uh, we need to talk about the. Biblical context, historical, theological, textual, and all that. This this tonight will be something of a um, adventure in exegesis, and I ask my friends here to question anything I say that they don't, they're not sure about, and call me in the carpet if I seem to be going wild. But I will start here, and then we'll see how we go. The, as Emily said, the passage appears in two places. It appears in Isaiah and in Micah. They were roughly contemporary. It's hard to know which of the prophets did it first and which cut and paste and plagiarized by the the work of the (laughs) Holy Spirit. It wasn't called plagiarism (laughs) in those days. They had very different ideas of (laughs) intellectual property. (laughs) It was was fine to take what somebody else had done and and transform it and do something better with it, especially when the Holy Spirit is the original author of both. (laughs) So that's okay. There's a little more textual background in Micah. Uh, we can look, look at Isaiah perhaps in a bit, but Micah, if this this passage where we we read about this flows out of what he's been talking about. What he's been talking about is God's wrath against Judah, and I'm going to back up into chapter three of Micah and read the background 
so that when we get to the swords and plowshares things, it sort of makes a little more sense. So the prophet Micah says this, but truly I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, I pray you, you heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house, the temple mountain, as the high places of the forest. That's the background that leads into chapter four. Notice just a couple particular things, I suppose. Micah was convinced of man's depravity. There's the, what's, what follows is no utopian. Well, you know, men, men are fundamentally good at heart, and given enough time and enough education, we can reverse these trends and we can come up with, there's none of that. <laughs> In fact, it's quite the opposite. You guys are a bunch of wicked scoundrels. God is angry with you. You're murderers. You build Zion with blood. The leaders, judges, prophets, priests, do so for money. They're all in it for money. And yet they hypocritically claim the, the presence and blessing of the Lord. Is not the Lord among us. And the verdict sounds pretty definite. Zion, for your sake, shall be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps. It's got to be laid waste. Now, it's going to take several generations before God does this. And in fact, in Jeremiah's day, uh, Jeremiah prophesies similar things, and some of the local princes and prophets want to kill him for this. Things have gone downhill a lot by then. But some of the princes say, wait, 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 wait. Micah said this in the days of Hezekiah, and they didn't kill him. They repented. Maybe we should do a little of that. And the princes who were out for Jeremiah's life said, okay, maybe. And grumbled a lot, but they didn't kill Jeremiah. But it's interesting that we have people within the biblical record, within the flow of history, looking back at this prophecy and understanding what Micah was saying. Yes, he's talking about the destruction of that city, but they also are arguing that because there was this revival in Hezekiah's day, however, in some respects, superficial it may have been, it was enough that God delayed judgment. So this is coming, but it need not come in our generation if we repent. Well, they didn't kill Jeremiah, but they didn't repent either. And it did come within their generation with a very short time. And so that part was fulfilled in the most literal way. Jerusalem was laid waste. It became a bunch of heaps and place for wild uh, plants to grow and such. But then we move into chapter four. And of course, there are no chapter breaks in the original. But in the last days. Now, last days is a kind of vagueish phrase. It can simply mean later on, hereafter, down the road, in days to come. But the further we go in the Old Testament, and particularly into the New, it begins to acquire a, a more decided connotation, if not definition. Most of the minor prophets, and in, in, in even beginning with Isaiah, the latter days are the days of Messiah. You can take it as the latter days of the Old Covenant, which would make sense, because Messiah will come in the latter days of the Old Covenant, so that would be a simple way out. Or perhaps Messiah begins the last days, and the last days reach all the way to the last day, in which case it's a synonym for the whole gospel era. For our purposes, that which one you pick does not matter a whole lot. What matters is he is talking about history. He's talking about redemptive history, the time when God is still at work pushing the gospel toward the salvation of the nations. He's not talking about heaven in the sense of Everybody in heaven is happy and no one fights and they all have plenty of whatever. No kidding. That's hardly a secret, nor does it need <laughs> two entire chapters to tell us that. It is not talking about eternity, although we could 
easily assume that if it gets this good in within time and history, eternity will outpace it by infinite amounts. That if this is the beginning, then what lays ahead in the new heaven and the new earth in its final form after the resurrection will be greater still. But the the point, and, and, and here we some ap, some um, references to the New Testament. Peter on the day of Pentecost quotes the prophet Joel. Joel in his prophecy doesn't give a time element; he just says later. But Peter says, "And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh." Mm-hmm. And Peter says, really rather bluntly, "This is that. Not mm-hmm. this is a forerunner of that. This is kind of like that." You like this? Wait till you see that. He's, this this is it. It's it's begun. The outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost was something that took place in the last days. The writer of Hebrews, God, who in sundry times and divers manners spake by the fa- spake of the fathers and times passed by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Last days again is the day when Messiah comes and fully reveals the Father. Paul speaks of the New Testament Church as those upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And John in 1 John is really blunt. Uh, there are many antichrists whereby we know it is the last hour. King James says last time, but the word is horror, it's last hour. Clock's mm-hmm. ticking, which would maybe a stronger argument for saying it's the end of the old covenant, but not necessarily a convincing one or clinching one. And there are other such passages. That's just a token amount. Paul warns about the evils that will come in the last day, on a couple of occasions in Timothy, and yet he immediately turns around and says, yeah, these evil people are coming. Timothy, beware of them. He's not mm-hmm. talking about something that's a thousand years off or 2,000. He's talking about something they were living in the midst of. In the last days, perilous times will come. Well, look back over the last 2,000 years. Have perilous times come? Yep. Paul knew what he was talking about. <laughs> but does that mean that all times must be perilous? Well, here's the counterbalance. Yes, sometimes certainly will be perilous and have been perilous. And ages of apostasy, times of unbelief, times of persecution, most certainly. And any eschatology that doesn't take that into account is kind of dreaming. But here, there's there's more. This is the other side of things. In the last days, it shall come to pass. That means God's decreed it and providentially will make it happen. That the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. Now, they did not necessarily know this when Micah wrote this, but these are images. God had not explained, look, the temple's going to be wasted, and you're going to come back from Babylon after 70 years, you're going to build a temple, and it's not going to be that big a deal, except this pagan named Herod's going to come along and dress it up just in time for the Romans to come and destroy it, and then you're not going to have it. That's not there, because it wasn't relevant to what they needed to hear. What they needed to hear was that the presence of God and the worship of God and the truth of God would not only endure, but would be exalted above all other powers and philosophies and competing religions. It shall be established in the top of the mountains. Mountains are symbols throughout scripture of kingdoms. See Revelation 17, for example. And so there's going to come a time when the mountain, the temple mountain, the the place of worship, Zion, is going to be exalted. And and as a result, people shall flow unto it. Micah says, Isaiah words a little differently. And this is how that's going to look. Verse 2, many nations shall come and say, come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. Now, there's a four coming up as to why that's going to happen. Uh, but the the first word describing the movement of these peoples that are flow, flowing. It's it's not trickling, it's flowing. It's, it's a big movement of people. We're not given percentages, but something that constitutes a flow. And it's it's voluntary. They're saying to one another, let's go learn the word of God. Let's go worship God. And the next phrase is a four. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Law, Torah, scripture considers revelation as well as commandment, the truth of scripture, and paralleled by the word of the Lord. 
There's a starting place, Zion, Jerusalem. Zion was originally the place where David built or pitched the temple for the Ark of the Covenant before Solomon built the temple. And then when Dave, or when um, Solomon moved the Ark into the temple, it still got the, the Temple Mount was still called Zion, although properly it was Mount Moriah. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that in the past. Mm -hmm. And so the Psalms, many of which were written by David before Solomon's temple, often speak of the Temple of the Lord and the house of the Lord as Zion. And the latest Psalm, later Psalmist, don't go back and correct him or start using a different word. Well, David said Zion. We, of course, now know it's Moriah, so we'll start using that word. And this continues on in the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews says, you are come unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And in Revelation, we see the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. So there is a transformation going here. It's not the temple as a building of stone, brick, and gems, and gold, and all that. It is the place where God dwells, where God manifests himself, where God's word comes from. And the hymns of the church have recognized that as well. The church, the kingdom of God, which are not exactly the same thing, but they're close enough. So this is what's happening. Out of out of God's people, out of the place of worship, out of from those who have the word of God, there it it that's flowing out. And the result is that people are flowing in. And for those of us who have read the, the end of the story. Great Commission on through Acts and the epistles, we know that this is historically is exactly what happened. It began in Jerusalem and Zion as the apostles preached. And then they, they went out from there and they continued to carry the gospel. And there, those who succeeded them carried it further and other generations carried it further. And the word kept going out and people came, people of all sorts, of all nations, and sometimes whole nations, came to worship God. This, this, is, this is the background here. Now, it's not all peachy keen. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any point. <laughs> he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. Before we get to the swords and to plowshares things, there's one other side to this that's, that's kind of a, a permanent other shoe in the prophets. Yes, the, the poor outpouring of the word and the spirit, but God judging among the nations. So there's nothing here of, of seamless, constant growth until everything is wonderful and perfect. There is, this is happening. The word is going out. The gospel is going out. People are coming in. But in the midst of this, there are judgments. God has nations to smash. He has enemies to bring down. Wars and rumors of wars and all that. Uh, you can think of Psalm 2 where the, the son takes that rod of iron and is smashing all that rise up against him. Uh, or Psalm 110 which is a wonderful psalm, and unfortunately, I, we just went blank and can't quote the words of it. So I will look real fast. And it says this, The Lord shall send his rod out of, the rod of its strength out of Zion. There's Zion again. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And then a little bit later, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. So, biblical eschatology has these two things going on here. There is the preaching of the word, which has great power and calls lots and lots of people in, but God is at, still out there smashing down resistance and bringing his judgments upon those who will not kiss the sun. So, biblical context, textual context, historical context, as, as people in Micah's day and Isaiah, Isaiah's day are looking, saying, you know, but the Babylonians are going to come and destroy it, so what's it all worth? Well, if all you care about yourself, um, then probably the answer is nothing. But if you are part of this story and part of this vision and part of this mission of God to save the nations, then there is great comfort in knowing that although I'm going to suffer, my children are going into captivity, my grandchildren may be some who come back, and it's not going to be really hot for them. But somewhere at the end of this, this is all an elaborate setup for God saving the nations. That's a different kind of hope. Mm -hmm. it, it's not the, well, you know, within five years, everything's going to be great. We don't have to worry anymore. And the <laughs> gospels, God's just going to send revival after revival, and the world will be transformed. That's not what this is saying. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we've talked before about 
labels and my own particular disdain for them. Because <laughs> after a while, any good label gets misunderstood and abused, both by friend and foe. Mm-hmm. So am I post-millennial? Well, depends on who defines it. <laughs> I've mentioned before uh, the phrase preppy post-millennialism. Mm-hmm. I take that to mean the, hey, everything's going to be great and we can just lean back and watch and God's going to save the world. Yeah, that, no. <laughs> no. The history of the world says no, that's not what's happening and not how it's going to happen. And yet we can look back at the day of Pentecost and see those who were saved, the 120 in the upper room, the 3,000, the 5,000 a few days later say, you know, there are a few more Christians today than then. Mm-hmm. Bible's in a lot more languages. Our creeds have gone from Jesus is Lord to the Westminster Standards and the Three Forms of Unity. Uh, there are very few nations where the name of Jesus is not known, although there are still some. Mm-hmm. And so we can look and see, ha- has God failed? Well, part of it kind of depends on your time frame, I think. Americans are really good at insisting that everything happened now to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, it's and all I've been, about America. We are all, the fulfillment. We're, we're <laughs> it, in our generation particularly. And I've been there when I was younger, very young. I, I was kind of there, you know, within, be, be, before I get much older, things are going to turn around. No, that's The Bible doesn't say anything like that. There may be a thousand years of darkness ahead of us for all we know. But that doesn't mean God's lost. We can look over history. I, I've told you before that one of my favorite um, songs to the tune of Russian hymn, ironically, <laughs> is God the All-Terrible. Mm-hmm. Because of one particular line, through the thick darkness, thy kingdom is hastening. That's something to meditate on. It's not that the kingdom is always visible and where uh, nations are opening their doors to the gospel and seminaries are being planted and mission stations set up and new governments are creating constitutions to recognize Jesus and everyone's modeling their law after the Bible and Christian schools are sprouting everywhere. We're not seeing that. We may someday. I don't know. Depends on how God has things planned. But we are constantly running into some weird little country someplace, at least in my experience, saying, hey, we just became Reformed Christians about 10 years ago, and we've heard about you guys. Yeah, I belong to a very small denomination that no one has heard of. <laughs> and it's, can, can, can you help us with, you know, you know, if you could, if you spoil, could give us $1,000, we can pay our pastor for a year. If you can give us... Books that you, you people have written, we'll translate them. We'll, 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 we want you to help us change our country. Now, we're small, but will you help us? And the temptation is, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm reminded that, um, oh, I think it was in the 70s. Uh, oh, what's his name? There, there was a gentleman, who um, Aaron Kayam who did a broadcast for the Christian Reformed Church, the Back to God Hour in French out of South Africa. Mm. And there, there are a lot of people who speak French in South Africa, or the Southern Africa, I should say, including particularly the Belgian Congo in those days, which was then called the Belgian Congo. <laughs> and a lot of people came to Christ, and a lot of people came to the Reformed faith, and they wrote back to Aaron and said, we want to form a Reformed Church. And he went to the CRC and they said, that's not part of our plan right now. I don't know what they were thinking or why they said that, but that's at least a very simple version. And uh, Heron was visiting our church and said, yeah, I got this great opportunity. There's a problem. The government would like a um, upfront payment of well, it was $3,000 or $5,000 or something. I forget what it was. To guarantee that this is a real, this, this real local indigenous church is being backed by white Westerners who have a lot of money, so we know it's a real church. What they were asking for was a bribe. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you bribe us and we'll let these people form a church just like yours. That's it? That's all you want? (laughs) Yeah. Small price to pay for I think I think we can. can, Yeah, I I think we can pay this bribe. Uh, Mm -hmm. And we did. And again... God, we hadn't planned this. We didn't. We were not part of the of the process that sent these these broadcasts into Africa. God just tagged us along the way and said, "Hey, you got money? Use it." Okay, <laughs> thanks. Moving on. <laughs> we haven't been terribly active. We were for a while. We haven't been active, very active late, lately. But the Reformed Confessing Ch- um, Church of the Congo was born. These. This is the. This is the thick darkness. This is where. 
How, how, if this is happening to us, how many places is this happening? How many churches, little churches out of the way, is God tapping to change the world? And, and each of us contributes just a little bit here and there. And to our brothers and sisters on the other side of the, of the world, it may seem huge. Mm-hmm. And to us, it's just, you know, let's not drink Starbucks for a year and put all our money together and we'll have, what, you know, $20,000. <laughs> um, but yeah, you never find out what what God did with the prophets who didn't bow the knee to Baal. Yeah. That's not the story he told us. Right. But he didn't do nothing with them. We know yeah. that for sure. They were they were still out there ministering. Mm-hmm. The, the, one of the points of the gospel story has to be, you know, God has all power in heaven and earth. Always has. Mm-hmm. He could have just thrown Satan into the abyss, knocked down all resistance, sent out the gospel, converted everybody, and it could be over real fast and very dramatically. He chose not to do that. Mm-hmm. What he chose to do was to use simple, foolish, fallen but converted Christians to change the world a little here, a little there, over a very long time. 2,000 years. I have students in my class, this Christian school, and these kids have grown up in churches that are evangelical, families that are Bible-believing, and these kids are 13, 14, 15, and still can't define justification by faith. It doesn't come quickly. It doesn't come easily. So if if that's not, if what I'm saying doesn't fit in with someone's post-millennialism, then I'm not post-millennial, I guess, in that <laughs> sense. And if your amillennialism fits in with this, great. Well, come on board. Mm-hmm. Uh, for people yeah, call just... themselves optimistic amills. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. I mean, talking about the insufficiency of labels. Yeah. Like I you know, not taking a side on this, I think is kind of a luxury. It's one that I'm leaning into <laughs> um <laughs> with with so many things. It's you know, a lot of people don't have the chance on such and such an issue to just not have an opinion. And really I I'm sitting back and I'm listening to teachers whose whose main focus is the gospel. Mm-hmm. And then now and then, you know, because it's all interrelated, because the gospel is not this isolated thing, you know, you get to eschatology. And when you listen to the substance of eschatology, people who are speaking biblically are all saying the same thing, <laughs> you know, whether Pretty the much. label fits or not. I, it's, I, the, the reality is that it's it's mixed. Is it optimistic or is it pessimistic? I prefer, I prefer those labels, but even those labels are yeah. insufficient because what do you mean by right. optimism? Exactly. We have this mixed image. Do you mean, a, do you mean a, so, a social gospel that produces some kind of flawless utopia? Well, that's not <laughs> well, biblical. I'm I'm right, very optimistic the... that um, you know the rapture is going to come and we're going to be saved. <laughs> yeah. You know. See, there's that kind of optimism too. Right. Uh, that when Hal Lindsey wrote the, the late great shows us is yeah. God is judging. There are nations that yeah. are afar off that need to be rebuked, yes. and that's happening at the same time that swords are being beaten into plowshares. Yeah. Hmm. It's not just one or the other. No, it's not. And, and with regard to Brian's remark, you know, Hal Lindsey, when he wrote mm-hmm. The Late Great Planet Earth, toward the end, he says, you know, we should we should be, he does say something like, we should be very optimistic because we should be living like people who don't expect to be around much longer. That's a form of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's one take on it, I guess. That's, that's a direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let's go ahead and, and, and oh, I was going to say one other thing before we go on. I think I've probably told you this too, but I'll mention it again. Our elders were interviewing a gentleman, a pastor, for possibly teaching a city seminary. He was a great guy. We really, we really love the guy, and everything he said was spot on. And we came to eschatology, and I have gained enough wisdom to not say which position do you take. <laughs> I said, you know, in fact, I said I'm not going to ask you that. I'm just asking you one simple question: Will the Great Commission be fulfilled? And he looked at me and he hesitated because he <laughs> knew what I was asking. And he, I don't remember, there was the, the him ha in his voice, but he said, yes, it will. Okay, good for me. That's all I want to know. Because when we don't, when we stop believing that, we start finding excuses not to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, you can say, we should be better than that. We should do it because God commands it. Yeah, we should. 
But when we're told up front, and it's going to happen, and all of your missionary activities are ultimately going to fail, and all the converts you want are going to be martyred or lost, it, it, it's harder. Yeah, you feel like the the kid who says, "Why should I clean my room? It's just going to get dirty." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the, my or, inner or monologue worse, every day. Yeah, so. or, 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 or worse, a car is going to come screaming through the lawn and run into it, and we're going to have to rebuild the whole thing. So you know, yeah. what does it matter? Why should I clean? And and you can you can say, well, you know what Martin Luther said about that? If Jesus were coming back tomorrow, I'd plant a tree. Honestly, Martin, why? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I think there are in that last in that last twenty four hours. I think I would think about the things to do. They mostly <laughs> involve going to everyone I know and saying, "Are you a Christian? <laughs> Have you heard the gospel? Have you really heard it?" Well, that could happen tomorrow. Well, yeah, and that's why God kind of gives us a few hints of we're on a long game plan here. The bridegroom tarries. You don't know the day or the hour. <laughs> the uh, wheat and the tares are. Growing the wheat and tares are still growing. Time. The earth yeah. is supposed to be full of people, and it isn't. Mm -hmm. The church is supposed to become a body knit together in love, fit for Christ. I, that's kind of hard to prove. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's a prayer we pray. Did he mean for us to just kind of, it to be sort of tentative? <laughs> like um, a wish. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a wish. Well, we ought to wish for it, but <laughs> we don't really expect God to do that. And, and, and so there, there is... In the basic elements of the faith, this encouragement that God is not playing a game with us. He's not saying, look, I've scattered some of my elect out there someplace. You know, there may be a few thousand scattered across the world. Go find them. And when the last one is saved, then Jesus will come. I mean, God could have done that, but I think the Bible story would be very different if that was his game plan. Uh, we're never told to go hunt and pick, and pick for the elect. We're just <laughs> <Yeah>. told <laughs> preach to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and and there, there, there seems like there's we're to preach not tentatively. You, you, you've heard the thing, how, how Calvinists witness, hello, God may or may not have a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> <sighs> we, we offer Jesus freely. He died for the world, not, yes, we understand limited atonement, and we understand that it's effective for the elect and all of that, but that's not the gospel as such. The gospel is Jesus died for sinners, believe and be saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what we're called to preach and not try to, well, you know, I don't think God would elect someone like that. We, we don't get to make those calls. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> let, let, let's just assume for the moment that at some point in Earth's future, and it might be a very distant future, not within our lifetime or our grandchildren's lifetime, possibly, maybe a lot longer, God is faithful to a thousand generations, that most nations find themselves composed mostly of Christians who are on their way to sanctification, but maybe aren't the greatest Christians ever, but really love the Lord and want to learn the Bible, want to do His Word. And most nations are like that. Do you think that maybe those nations would decide not to wage war on one another? You think? I mean, it's true, Baptists and Presbyterians still do little snide remarks across at each other, but we don't- Even, we, even Catholics and Protestants have pretty much chilled. Yeah, we've got to the point where we don't try point. to kill each other anymore. Yeah. So, you know, thumbs up for us. God has <laughs> sanctified his church to that point. Can we take it to the next level where there are enough Christians in most countries- at least the big ones who have nuclear weapons, so that we just decide we're not going to do that anymore. In fact, we're going to trim back our governments a bit in the first place. If that were to happen, and of course, it's not it's the preaching of the gospel. It's also God smashing all opposition, all those people who have nuclear weapons and want to blow up other people for the fun of it. This is what happens. He shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall, here it is, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not, excuse me, lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And that's where Isaiah's prophecy stops, but Micah adds just a little bit more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. 
vine and fig tree. It's an expression that was used back in the days of Solomon when the kingdom was at peace. It's used a number of other times, sometimes a bit rhetorically or even uh, facetiously, but the idea is <laughs> clear enough. You, you have your own little garden back there, and, and when the day's over, you can go and you can take a nap out there, and you're safe. You're it's not a afraid. beautiful image. That's a beautiful, powerful image. <laughs> And it's interesting that it's not, you know, the community garden. No, it's <laughs> his own garden, his own fig tree and vine. Um, but the the images are gardeny and agricultural. But but then he adds this, and for for years and years, this confused me because after saying that these nations are basically going to become Christian, or at least most people in them are, he says this: for all people will walk, everyone. In the name of his God. Mm. And I used to think, well, wait, that sounds like he's going back on it. That the nations will continue to walk in, in the ways of their false gods. So, uh, finally, I figured out what he's saying. He's simply stating a truth. People walk in the ways of their gods. If you worship Baal, you walk in the way of Baal. If you worship, worship the sovereign state, you're going to walk in the ways of the sovereign state. If you worship science, you're going to walk in the way of science. It's a statement um, of a generality. Yeah, like it's the, a generality. train up a child in the way he should go. Yeah, and when he's old, that's how he's going to live. <laughs> your your religion, your worldview, your worship dictates your culture, mm -hmm. and that's an obvious thing to stay here. So you can because you know what happens here is wait, I uh, Micah, how is this possible? There are so many wicked people. Yeah, people walk in the ways of their god. Obvious. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to change your gods. If you change the god, you change the culture. You change the civilization. And, and that's so, not the goal per se. Changing not, the civilization not is not the goal. <laughs> it's the worship it's, of God. And yeah. this is the outflow this of it. Is, that's this a good is the thing. Fruit of it. Yeah. And yet it's not something to despise either. You know, yeah, having having a Christian home doesn't mean that our foremost goal is to have nice, well behaved, uh, polite children who are safe and clean and eat well. But right, I don't because think... if you focus on that alone to the yeah. iso in isolation, you've lost the main thing, the Christian yeah, home, because yeah. <laughs> yeah. you've got a moralistic home now. <laughs> yeah, you have a moralistic home, and you're, you're guilty of idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, so while we were saying that, my wife just handed me a note that I think is uh, ap tightens up the focus here. What we're talking about is as you come to know your God, you do more and more walk after that God. You look back at America in the late, mid-1700s, and people gave lip service to a god, the creator, the god of nature, who may or may not have been the triune god of the Bible, but people weren't precise. And a lot of people just said, oh, he said God. That's my god, obviously. And as late as the 50s, 60s, and even 70s, people would say, oh, this candidate, he mentioned God. And he quoted the Bible. Obviously, he's a Christian and he shares my values. No, <laughs> it's not necessarily so. <laughs> and But today, uh, you say God and people know exactly what you mean because the people who are saying God are Christians now, pretty much. Because mm -hmm. there's only one, or you're talking Allah, but they'll say Allah. They won't say God, mostly. They, they will be very precise. We're getting more precise. And as we get more precise, the battle lines are drawn. And the judgments come, and our need to be relevantly preaching God's word in words that both our enemies and friends can understand pushes on us all the more. My wife's note also mentions the parable of the wheat and tares. Part of eschatology has to be the reckoning mm -hmm. that as time passes, Christians will become more self-consciously Christian. The church will become more self-consciously the church. I mentioned before, we start with... Jesus is Lord, and then we move to the Apostles' Creed, and then the Nicene Creed, and then we come to the Reformation, and we get um, the Formula of Concord and Calvin's Catechism, and before too long, we have the Westminster Standards, which are rather voluminous as, as things go, <laughs> and the Three Formula of Unity, which put together probably equal the Westminster Standards. And the Westminster and, is considered a consensus document. <laughs> yeah, and it is, and and that's you know that that is an excellent point to bring in here. So is, so is the Heidelberg Catechism. They're very much consensus documents because nobody thought that everybody was agree on everything because they knew from experience they didn't. And so they tried to frame things of, okay, 
What can we say that most of us in this room are going to accept and sign on and not walk out in a huff? And and so you look at the Westminster Stands, and from our point of view, wow, that's pretty radical. And they're they're taking some really hard positions. Yeah, well, there were a lot of people in that group who were, yeah, we believe that. I also believe this thing over here. <laughs> Don't mention that right now, please. You talk about your talk about your people back home. They were trying to find the common ground, but it was biblical common ground. Mm-hmm. Our school, you know, we have a confession of faith. It is Trinitarian. It is very, very mildly Calvinistic. We say, we speak, I, no, we don't even speak of the sovereignty of God. We speak about faith being the gift of God. Mm-hmm. That's it. Now, that's enough. Because once you acknowledge that faith is God's gift, not man's creation, you're Calvinist, if you follow it out consistently. But mo- most people don't. And so we're using a, con- a very broad consensus document. It's Trinitarian, it's Chalcedonian, it's six-day creationist. And, you know, with that, there's enough for us to teach our Bible classes. Mm-hmm. And 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 go from there, and so one day perhaps we will have something even more definitive than our reform standards, but probably not next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're 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 in a process of growth, and to canonize the the reform standards would be a huge mistake. Mm-hmm. I, I I think they're really accurate. They may be almost flawlessly accurate, except one or two points where they kind of disagree. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm not a cemetery, and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but aside from that, there, there, there are these wonderful statements of faith that we can agree with, mm-hmm. and yet there's more we could say, and one day maybe we'll say, if God gives us time and if he keeps growing the church. So that's part of this whole vision. The church becomes more the church with the result of the culture she influences becomes more consciously, self-consciously Christian. At the same time, the world becomes more consciously the world. When I was a kid, we hardly even knew what the word homosexual meant. Mm-hmm. And when you when you talked about it, you you said it in low whispers, or you used um, what we considered cuss words to describe such people, because we didn't know anybody like that. That was weird. Uh, it was mentioned in passing in Casablanca, there are a couple references <laughs> yeah. to homosexuality, <laughs> and most people don't catch them. They're so oblique. Yeah. They're, yeah. Um, the the word uh, one the young guy who's keeping company with uh, Sydney Greenstreet with um, what's the character's name the the uh, fat man I forget the the name um, he's called the Gunzel which is the word that's taken out of the original novel everyone thought the Gunzel meant a guy who carries a gun that is not what it meant <laughs> <laughs> but nobody knew what it meant and so they left it in figuring well it's going to catch that one no they didn't it has a very particular connotation in that culture and yet now if you don't say positive things about homosexuals you're going to be berated accused of being a hate monger a nazi and all kinds of other things and so that's within 50 60 years the world has become more worldly more self-consciously so now is that a good thing well as long as they have power and the trappings of power that christians put in place for 200 years yeah that's kind of bad but can that lifestyle sustain a culture over centuries and the simple answer is no they don't produce children how can they well they get they have to get our children yes let's make sure that doesn't happen please <laughs> they're working on that that, yeah, that, that they, is their goal <laughs> that is their goal it has to be their goal uh, if they care and most of them unfortunately apparently do so um there's just a little bit more here yeah, for all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Verse 7, skipping a little bit, the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. So one thing that I haven't said, and we should say just in passing before we, we leave, the second coming of Christ is not in view here. This is not something that happens, yeah, in the last days, once Jesus returns, that's not here. Now, I, I can give props to our, our premillennial friends in that they realize that this is a historical setting, but they miss what's doing it. It's not the return of Christ in glory. It's not that Jesus comes and forces everybody to worship him. Um, that's a very different approach to sociology, to eschatology, and to the doctrine of salvation and the covenant. If we say, you know, the gospel pretty much fails to win people, well, Jesus will come here and twist their arms and get their worship that way. That's not in harmony with what the Bible is saying. 
-hmm. What it's saying here is the word of the Lord is flowing forth from the church while God judges the nations, and that's what's going to make the difference. However long it takes, in whatever form it takes, and however sneaky, and however much darkness it moves through. And this, when Paul is speaking in Galatians 3, he says, and God preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. That's this. That's this. God blessing all nations. And Paul calls it the gospel. It's not just about me being saved, although that's really important to me. <laughs> yeah. But it. God's vision's bigger. He wants to save nations. And that's what Jesus said. Go make disciples of all nations. Yeah. Good stuff. We should switch to recommendations. Emily, you're we supposed have to go first. <laughs> oh, well, well, I'm not supposed to go last, so I will go first. Um, there's an episode of a podcast called Cooper and Carrie Have Words. I recommend the podcast broadly. Um, but there's a specific episode that's available currently called Why Build a Cathedral mm. with Steve Jeffrey. Um, and their, their guest, Steve Jeffrey, is a post-millennialist by his own labeling, speaking of labels. Um, yeah, the, the joke is kind of, wow, how did a British man become this optimistic about anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I will tell you the... The library of this podcast that's available does rotate. They only have so many of the archive available at a time. So mm -hmm. it's on Spotify now. It's not behind the paywall. If you want to get behind the paywall, you can give them money, which, you know, I don't disrecommend. I do that <laughs> and get lots of benefit from it. But this one is available for free right now. So there's a time limit. I don't know how long that's going to be the case. Okay. All right. Brian, you got one? I have two actually, because I just okay. thought of the second one. Speaking of podcasts, uh, I've recommended a podcast before called um, "The Rest Is History." It's mm. hosted by with Tom Holland with Tom Holland and Dominic oh. Sandbrook, who I do not mm. know as well from his writings. Uh, Tom Holland is fantastic, though he's like yeah. my favorite agnostic. Um, <laughs> he he's the one that wrote that really fantastic book, uh, Dominion, oh, yeah. which is yeah. about. But which I'm Christian still history, reading. which I've also recommended. Uh, I just love the guy. I'm told he is a, a, a church attender. That's he funny. is really. Ooh. That is an update, uh, given my last knowledge. Anyway, that's exciting. That's good for him. Yeah. Um, they. I just found. I just listened to an episode because I've, I've been. I'm still working my way through their backlog of episodes as well. Um, but they actually had on another podcaster and your comment about paywalls reminded me because it's Dan Carlin from hardcore mm. history and so another podcast that I've recommended as well. Uh, mm -hmm. He's known for his four and a half to as long as six hour episodes uh, on given topics. And sometimes there are multiple four and a half to six hour episode <laughs> um, <laughs> series on, on a particular topic. I think the last one was on the history of Imperial Japan from its beginnings as a world power before world war one um to its fall in 1945 really great episode but anyway the episode of the rest of history where they interviewed him was very fun it was a two-parter uh because you know you can't fit dan into one episode um <laughs> and it's really good so uh i recommend that one i don't remember what it was called but it if you search Dan Carlin, Rest is History, it'll probably show up. Mm -hmm. uh, the second recommendation is a TV show that I grew up watching that my wife and I have started watching through together. Uh, it is Psych, oh. which <laughs> is Fun. excellent. Because um, I, I, I just watched it as it came out as a kid because we had cable. And <laughs> I am watching it now and I missed like 80% of the jokes <laughs> because of my youth. Um, which isn't to say that all the jokes I missed are inappropriate. It's a cable <laughs> show. It's a modern show. Those are there too. But um, there's just a lot of references that I just, they just went over my head. Cause I, <laughs> I, I thought that I didn't live under a rock and, and I did. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I recommend psych. It's, yeah. it's just the, the writing's clever and the, the character dynamics are amazing. The two main guys, they're just like mm -hmm. best friends since childhood. Mm -hmm. And it's like wholesome, brotherly <laughs> affection and and yeah. love and making fun of each other because that's what you do <laughs> yeah. when you have so a wholesome cool. relationship with another guy yeah, yeah. exactly yeah <laughs> I, i'll tell you 
because you'll appreciate this. One of my favorite gifts that I have ever given is a pineapple shaped cutting board where I did some lettering work and Mm -hmm. David did wood burning over my lettering work to make it permanent. And it says, you know, that's right. Ah. (laughs) I've been waiting for someone to say, I've heard it both ways. I was just going to say that. (laughs) (laughs) It's so applicable in so many circumstances. The number of times it's come up, I, like, it, it's so good. <laughs> well, my recommendation is a little more theological, and that kind of, I feel sad about that for some reason, because <laughs> yours are more fun. Um, Theology is fun. St. Athanasius wrote a book called On the Incarnation of God the Word. My homeboy. Uh, it exists in translation. It's on the internet, easy to find. Uh, but the translation is into an older English, so you might have to work with it a little bit. But what he's doing is arguing simply that Jesus is God. And among his arguments are the coming of Christ shut down all the magic, all the oracles, all the demons that inhabited and infested the ancient world, and they were many. Uh, he has empowered young people to live chaste, sexually chaste lives, mm-hmm. which was a complete revolution in the pagan world. Mm -hmm. But along the way, he mentions the effects of the gospel in bringing peace. And he quotes Mm -hmm. the passage we've been talking about. He looks to the barbarian nations on the borders of the empire and says, they're beating their swords into into plowshares, their spirits into pruning hooks. It's happening, guys. And only the Messiah, only God could accomplish this. And of course, we can look back and say, well, it began and then it failed and then it kind of picked up and then it failed. You know, it's not all done. But he understood that peace on earth is the fruit of the gospel and that there is no other way to bring peace. And so uh, as a history book and as a theology book, Athanasius is the one who defended the deity of Christ in Nicaea. So there is, there's much to profit. And it's not Mm -hmm. a terribly long book. Yeah. C.S. Lewis wrote a famous He He wrote uh, an introduction to it. Yeah. 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 And as oh. as we've been kind of talking tangentially about history, I think that brings up an, another relevant point to this discussion is that every time we look at history, we have a limited view. We have to oh, take yes. a beginning and an oh, yeah. end point. Otherwise, we're not doing history. Right. right. So when we look at the scope of things and say, well, it went up or it went down, that's because we're only looking of at where we one are. select point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a framework we have to right. impose on the things that are happening. God is the only one who doesn't have to do that. He's yep. the one who can see what's really going on. <laughs> um, and so we take him at his word when he says, this is the way it is. Yep. Um, you reminded me of something. It's not a recommendation, but it's just a funny connection. Speaking of introductions that Lewis has written, hmm. um, he wrote the an introduction or a a favorable critical review when Tolkien's book, Lord of the Rings, oh, yes. came out. Yes. And uh, in it, he compared Tolkien and his work to uh, not Dante Alighieri, but another like major Italian poet, classical author of some kind. And Tolkien later was like, you know, I, I'm very grateful for, for uh, Lewis for writing that, but... I think he could have done without that. (laughs) It's very British. (laughs) Yep. All right. Um, Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us for any reason, send us a question, comment, response, insults, uh, halting towards Zion at gmail.com is the best way to contact us. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate you tuning in and we hope you will join us next time. 